What I'd like to do is, is take you on a little quick trip through North American bats and spend some time talking about New Jersey. And while this may not have a lot of direct impact in terms of global warming and what happens with bats, it does have a relationship to introduced species, non-native species, the invasive species we hear so much about that may be less um, related to global warming, but more related to human impact. So there's definitely a human impact story to be told here. So the bat business is going to be kind of a quick, I'm going to show you lots of pictures, give you some kind of fun facts, and eventually get into a little bit of the research that I do, and then some of the things that are going on here, especially in the Northeast, that are appearing in the news almost on a monthly basis. And those are the things you may be hearing more about and probably will be hearing more about. And I, I put this picture up because the, the mental image that a lot of people have on bats is this. People usually don't think, the public in general usually doesn't think of one single bat at a time. When they think bats, it's probably from a Batman movie, and there are thousands of them, and, and they're all whipping around, it's dark, it's a Halloween kind of image, and, and that really is kind of the typical stereotype image that people have of bats. Meanwhile, for me, this would be wonderful to see this many bats. These days, here in the Northeast, we won't be seeing those kinds of numbers anymore for a long, long time and we didn't see numbers exactly like this ever. This is uh, from out in the western United States. So anyway, the question mark is because we're not sure what's going to happen next with bats, especially in the Northeast. The exclamation point is, well, they're, they're part of these natural ecosystems, or let's say human impacted ecosystems in which we live, and we have to figure out how important they are to us and whether we want to try to protect them or if we're going to do what we do with most creatures and, and kind of do a, a compromise of protection and getting by as humans. So here we go. Bats in flight look like this. It's a very typical picture of any bat in North America. And again, North America, because if I talked about the world in general, we'd be talking about bats with wingspans up to six feet. And this bat has a wingspan of maybe five inches. So this is, although looking kind of big, maybe at night for you, if you see one flying around a street light, they're kind of small. The body of this one's about this big. It's a common species around here. But typically, and one thing to notice is that its wings are membranes between outstretched fingers, really long, skinny fingers. Five of them, though, just like you have. And a thumb is that piece or finger sticking out at the top of the wing. And then the mouth is open. The mouth open because the bat is making sounds and then listening for echoes of those sounds to determine where it is and, and what it's doing in terms of food to eat, in terms of trees in its way, obstacles in its path. And we'll get to more about this because some of you are probably thinking, well, it has to do that because it can't see. And we'll get there. The wings of bats look like this. And these are gloved hands holding a bat's wing out, and what you can see from the bat here is that those long bony structures are fingers, and there's this little thin membrane in between that looks really, really fragile, but it's actually quite tough. It has blood vessels, it has nerves, and the bats can feel the membrane, and meanwhile, it's very thin and lightweight, and it's a very good wing for a bat. See the little thumb sticking up, too. Otherwise, its bones are just like ours. It's a, a mammal. It's fur-covered, just like we are. So very little different, uh, very little differs in structure except for those long fingers. Bats in the United States have appearances like this. It, it is about as fantastic as it gets here in the United States. If we look worldwide, we'd find some even more wild looking, I should say, or maybe unusual looking bats. But in this country, this is um, a pretty good cross-section of what to expect. Everything from that spotted bat way up there in the top left corner, which has ears almost big enough to wrap itself up in. And by the way, we're not exactly sure why those long ears exist in this bat, whether it has to do with hearing, which seems obvious, or if it has to do with losing heat, like a jackrabbit, thermal regulation, because this animal does live in hot places of the western United States. The other bats have appearances that are kind of crazy looking in terms of their facial, facial features, especially the ghost face bat, which you kind of hard pressed to even find its mouth because its face is so wrinkled. What's interesting is the long nose bat. If you notice, it's different. And look at its ears, its eyes, and its muzzle. And note how different that is, or those three things are from the other three bats. 
and I'll come back to that here in a little while with pictures just to illustrate why those features might be different like that. Otherwise, the other three bats are really typical looking in terms of ear size, eye size, uh, their snout or muzzle size for bats here in the, in the United States. Oh, a few, few facts. Does that sound yeah. here? I don't know, maybe interference of some kind. All right, so a, a few facts here, if we can get past the little sounds the ceiling's making. Bats are the only flying mammals. There are other mammals that glide, like flying squirrels, but these are the only ones that have wings that actually flap their wings and can go into flight and maintain flight. In fact, some are so good at it, they're almost like hummingbirds. Bats, even though occurring in this country and also New Jersey, are mostly tropical. So most of the species are in the tropics and in the warm tropics, like tropical rainforests. And that's where we see a lot of really large species, like the so-called flying foxes, which are in Southeast Asia and have wingspans up to about six feet. There are about 45 species at about, it depends on the time of year, it depends on the science, especially along the Mexican-U.S. border, because there are a lot of species down there. So 45 plus or minus, maybe one or two. And nine in New Jersey is pretty accurate. You have to look at 12 months of the year, though. For example, right now, this time of year, there are not nine species in New Jersey. There are fewer than that because some of them actually migrated south, kind of like birds do, to spend winter in other places. The food of bats is where things really get interesting, and especially if you look at bats worldwide. As you can see, that, that first line, animals, fruit, seeds, nectar, blood, it's true. And the thing to be careful about interpreting this is it depends on the species. There are three species of bats called vampire bats that feed on blood, period. They don't feed on flowers, they don't feed on insects. So when you talk about a bat's diet, it's very restrictive. If a bat eats insects, that's it. If it eats nectar, the fluid, the sugary fluid at the base of flowers, that's it in terms of a species. What's most interesting is if you look at bats in other places other than the U.S., you find that some bats eat frogs, some bats eat other bats, some bats eat fish, some bats eat shrimp. There are bats in Baja, California that actually troll for shrimp in tidal pools. This country, it's mostly insects, with uh, about three species in the desert southwest that feed on flower nectar and pollinate flowers. New Jersey, it's all insects. Wingspan inches to feet, so it depends. In this country, the biggest wingspan is about like this of bats out in the western United States and California. In New Jersey, uh, this would be about the biggest wingspan in terms of length of, or width of wingspan. Most bats around here are about like this. And their bodies range from about like this in New Jersey to about like that. So not really spectacular, but when you see the wings out, the animal looks pretty big. Very different about bats is the way they sleep. They sleep head down, and when they hang from something, we refer to it as roosting. If a bird perches, it's upright. So roosting is hanging upside down, and this is a natural position for bats. And in some ways, physiologically, they're built to do this, but otherwise, they're pretty much like us. There isn't much different about them being able to hang upside down than us. I bring this picture up because the food of bats, even though in this country it's usually insects, there are a few cases where the bats eat things other than insects. Can you figure out what that is from the picture? This bat's actually eating a scorpion. This bat's a very common species out in the desert southwest. So if you lived in Arizona, New Mexico, you'd probably have these roosting under your deck, which isn't necessarily a bad thing. Most bats use echolocation, that is they make sounds and listen for the echoes coming back. That's what bats do here in New Jersey. In some countries in the world, there are species of bats that don't do this, in fact don't even have the ability to do this, like the big fruit-eating bats in Southeast Asia. But most bats do, and they have the ability in hearing to hear mostly very high-pitched sounds that we can't hear. And the echoes tell the bats a lot about their surroundings. Bats don't fit the graphs in ecology books. When you look at the size of a mammal and its lifespan, if you've ever seen that graph or figure in a textbook, 
It begins with little animals like mice, and it usually ends with big animals like whales or elephants, mammals, and it's a nice, almost a one-to-one -one relationship between longevity and size. In other words, the bigger the mammal, the older it, or the more years it often lives, bats don't fit this because bats are more in the category of animals the size of even larger than horses. Horses might have a 20-year lifespan, dogs and cats a little bit less than that. Bats shouldn't live this long according to ecological rules. One reason they might, by the way, is because most bats hibernate and that kind of puts them in a dormant stage for months at a time. But otherwise, we don't really have a, have a clear picture. By the way, the 35 years is a big brown bat, which is one of the species that used to be common here in New Jersey, still is to some extent. 35 years is a long time. The bats we capture in the wild aren't necessarily that old just because they undergo more stress and strain in the wild than they do in captivity. Flight speed is nothing really spectacular, 30, 35 miles an hour. However, if you combine this with aerial acrobatics and flying through a forest and catching insects and not hitting a single leaf or twig, this is pretty amazing stuff. And in pitch darkness. The reproduction rate is slow. Bats are small. They are not like rats and mice that reproduce frequently during the year and in large numbers. With bats, it might be one or two offspring per year. The offspring are called pups. And they're born hairless. They look just like the typical baby mammal, like this. By the way, this is an Indiana bat, which is federally endangered here in the northeastern United States. Indiana, it was named because it was found in Indiana originally, but they do occur here in New Jersey. And this one we captured one night. The next day, we looked in the bag. We had it in a holding bag waiting for someone from U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service to check something else out about it. And I remember looking in the bag, holding it up, and my graduate student had caught it the night before, and I looked in the bag and said, there are two bats in here. And she was, well, no, there's just one. So this was a pregnant female that gave birth overnight inside this cloth holding bag. The bats were both fine. But it's a good example of what a pup looks like. Hairless, and I guess to a mother, it's a beautiful baby. And that pup will remain very close to mom, will nurse, will feed on milk, just like a typical mammal, for about a month or five to six weeks maybe and before it begins to fly on its own. All right, so now here's some kind of um, misconceptions maybe about bats. Let's see what you think. You've heard the expression, blind as a bat. Is it true? First, do bats have eyes? Yeah, okay, well at least based on the pictures you've seen, they do. And their eyes in this part of the country, like New Jersey, their eyes are typically small, but they see very, very well. Mostly shades of gray because they're nocturnal. So most nocturnal animals, night-loving animals, like deer ra around here, raccoons, skunks, see in shades of gray very, very well, and very well after dark. Uh, we can't see nearly as well as they can. So bats are not blind at all. They see quite well. And sometimes they use eyes alone when they're navigating at night, not just using sound. Common misconception, bats will get caught in your hair. Be careful when you're out at night, or especially if one's in your house by accident. And if you have hair that's, let's say, big hair, then your chances are, well, no, they're not. Uh, I don't know of any, any example of a bat getting caught in someone's hair. So you don't have to worry about that. In fact, bats are so capable of doing what they do. Remember, 30 miles an hour or 35 through a forest without hitting a leaf or a twig, catching insects, it can avoid your hair very easily. This one's, um, notice I underlined the word all. Rabies is associated with bats. In fact, we even think that e it evolved in bats which is interesting that the rabies that you hear about of foxes and raccoons and skunks, dogs and so forth, really came originally from bats. And what we do know about bats and rabies is that there's a small percentage, always, that has rabies, which is why any people that handle bats, including myself and my students, should be immunized against rabies. And we know that they carry it, but to only a very small number of bats in any given population, and they don't 
experience outbreaks like we see in foxes and dogs and other animals. So there, there's nothing in the news you're going to hear about an outbreak of rabies in bats that kills a lot of them. It just doesn't happen. It's always at a very low level and the good news is that you don't have to worry about being out at night because there are a bunch of rabid bats flying around. There won't be. So it's extremely rare for a bat to be aggressive at all while flying around with rabies. Usually they get sick and they give the rabies to another bat back where they spend the day, usually in a building or a tree somewhere, and that's the end of it. That's the good news. Fleeter mouse, if you've heard that, it's the name of any of you opera fans. Fleeter mouse is a European name for bats, but yet it means flying mouse. So a bit of a misconception. If you think of mice and rats with buck teeth, then think of the bats. The pictures I've showed you so far are not very many. You'll see more where the teeth look more like a dog or a cat. So actually bats are more closely related to us than they are to rodents. So they are not rodents. Do bats dive at humans? I hear this a lot. The bat dove at me. It was coming right after me. What do I do? And uh, my comment would be, well, just stand there because it's going to fly right past you. And in, these are the cases where a bat's been found like under a deck umbrella or maybe behind curtains inside a room of the house. If you have a house and you've left a door or a window open, a bat flies in typically mid to late summer. It's probably a juvenile bat. It's exploring and it gets itself in trouble. And then you panic. No need because you could just simply open the window and door back up again, close off the room and it'll fly back out or it'll fly right past you, not diving at you. But bats don't jump into the air to take flight like birds do. They don't have leg muscles like that. Instead, they have to drop, get air under their wings, and in doing so, if you're in their way next to something they're dropping from, they'll have to drop and kind of come at you just to get past you because it takes that distance to get air under their wings so they can fly. So they are different in birds in that respect. Bat guano, I mentioned this because you can this is commercially available. You can buy bat guano from especially organic gardening magazines. It's pretty good stuff. And it's high in nitrogen because of the insects the bats eat. It's good fertilizer. And uh, does it pose a threat? No. So you're safe in using it. Now, if you have bats in your attic and you have two tons of bat guano in your attic, I'd recommend you get rid of it. But uh, otherwise, because it can pile up and, and it doesn't smell real good, but it does serve as really good garden fertilizer. Okay, so the so what, now I'm going to start to speed up a little bit. We know bats are beneficial because they eat insects, and in many cases, insects that are pests to humans. So beneficial is a human thing here. Beneficial in terms of eating insects that might influence us economically, like crop pests. In worldwide scope, bats are important as pollinators of flowers. They're important because they eat seeds and disperse the seeds just like the birds do around here when they eat berries and then you find they just landed in a tree branch or a tree branch above your car and now they've pooped on your car and that is now a nice packet of seeds plus fertilizer. Well, bats do the same thing, mostly in tropical countries and they're real important for that. So their beneficial nature in this country is about insects, a little bit with pollination in the desert southwest, but in other countries it's about seed dispersal and pollination. The typical story with bats, like birds and like so many animals native, wherever you go in the world, there is pollution in habitats, there's habitat destruction, like clearing of forests. So this story is a very common theme to others that you've already heard about human impacts. And then the recent thing, and I'll spend a little bit of time later after I show some pictures of New Jersey bats. Uh, white nose syndrome is something that's been in the news a lot it's still a big deal. In fact, it's going to probably become an even bigger deal before it's over. And wind farms, wind farms, these are very large wind turbines that are being manufactured for electrical generation. And we'll talk about that a little bit too. I'll show you a couple of pictures. And, and what impacts these have, literally speaking, on bats. Okay, so first thing I'm going to talk about with bats, there are two major themes for bats in terms of conversation. And one theme is food. Where do they go to get it? What do they eat? And then the other thing is where do they spend the day? Where do they sleep? And if you can protect, if you want to protect bats, those two things, then you're on the right track. So protect the food source, protect the place where they spend the day. 
So the, fur the food part is first. And I'm going to focus on the U.S. bats and primarily New Jersey. So the first thing, and this is a U.S. story, not a New Jersey story. This is mostly in Arizona and New Mexico. There are three species of bats in this country that feed on flower nectar. By doing that, by sticking their heads into flowers and feeding on the nectar, they get pollen on themselves that they transport from flower to flower and they pollinate flowers. So this is great for the cacti that the bats are actually visiting. So I'll show you a couple of pictures here and you'll get the drift. So imagine this desert setting, you've seen pictures like this, whether it's in the cartoons or in real life, if you've ever been to the western part of the United States, the desert southwest. This is a setting that could be in Arizona, for example. Uh, Tucson, Arizona is a great spot to see saguaro cactus and other forms of, of cacti. So this setting you see, desert, it's not forest like it is in New Jersey, but all those different cacti out there owe their existence in large part to bats, believe it or not. So just a couple of decades ago, we discovered how important the bats were to pollinating these. So here comes a bat. Nice pictures from Bat Conservation International. Good web source, by the way, for information on bats. So here comes this bat. This is the one with the long nose, the big eyes, and the little ears. So flowers don't make a lot of noise. So it's not listening for flowers blooming, but it has a big nose. It's smelling the flowers, which are blooming mostly at night, and it has big eyes to do what? White flowers blooming at night. White, a great color to see at night. Why are skunks black with a white stripe? so you see them to avoid them. And white, then, is a really good color. In fact, flowers colored white are typically night-pollinated flowers. So here's a good case in point. So here comes this bat zooming in. It's flying like a hummingbird now. It's going to hover just outside that flower, stick its head in. So this is a nice cutaway. It's a great shot. And you can see its tongue sticking out just a little bit way over there. And notice the fur right about to here. Back here it's real dark brown. Here it's light colored because it's covered by pollen. So the pollen it could care less about. It wants nectar. But by visiting the flowers it's actually introducing these grains of pollen to the female part of the flower right here. And once these pollen grains stick to that, pollination has occurred. So it's a great mechanism, a great design for the bats and the flowers. This is not New Jersey though, so you'd have to go out to the desert southwest to see this. Meanwhile, here, closer to home, bats eat insects. They usually listen for them. Sometimes, like Katie did in late summer, the bats will literally listen to where that sound's coming from and fly over there and grab it. Or, just flying around, bats will echolocate the insects, in other words, use echoes, and home in on them and catch them and eat them. So that's very typical of a, what, what a bat does during the night. And where it is, it could be anywhere except really open spaces. Bats like to be in protected places for them, which is usually forest. So they don't usually go out over big lakes. They don't go out over big expanses of open territory with maybe a little bit of an exception in the desert. And I mentioned high altitude because we found bats eating insects at 10,000 feet where sometimes insects will fly high, catch wind currents, and drift for miles. In, the bats have discovered this and will sometimes go really high to eat the insects that are up there. And water, I just want to mention this because wherever you find bats, you'll find water. They need to drink water just like we do. And after spending a hot day in the summer roosting somewhere, spending the day, they're thirsty. And the first thing they're going to do when they come out of that place where they spent the day is go find some water to drink. So it's not just about food, it's also about drinking water and clean drinking water. By the way, this could be your swimming pool in the backyard. So if you've ever been in your swimming pool at dusk and have a bat dive in, it's not diving at you, it's coming in for a drink. And bats do drink water like on the wing. They'll come in and skim the surface of the water to get a drink. Places like this are great bat spots. This is down in the Pinelands in New Jersey. This is near Bat's Toe. If you've ever been down there, great canoeing down there. But it's also really good spots for bats. So they like the water, they like that forest, and there are a lot of insects here for them to eat. And it's one of the places where I do some of the work I do, including places like this. This is also in southern New Jersey. This is a cedar swamp, which looks kind of Jurassic Park-ish, 
park-ish. Yet now imagine a bat flying through this, 25, 30 miles an hour, slow down a little bit, zipping around, catching insects, and not hitting a single leaf or twig at dark times of the day, right? So it's, it's pretty amazing. The bats are doing this. They're emitting sounds or listening for echoes back. That's what those lines mean. That's a little brown bat. And yeah, that's the name. It's not too imaginative, but was a common species around here before white nose syndrome hit just recently. So I'll get to that here in a bit. Bats catch insects on the wing. So the bats flying, the insects flying. What you don't see here is you see that moth that's in the bat's mouth. When the bat caught the moth, it actually caught it with its tail. So right as it got to the moth, it actually stalled out, if you know anything about flying, brought the tail up, made like a little basket, caught the moth, and then reached down with its mouth to grab the moth. So it's a real quick little maneuver to get this animal. So it doesn't catch it in its mouth. And the reason for showing you that moth is because its larval stage is called a corn earworm, in that particular case, which causes millions of dollars worth of crop damage in this country. Bats like to eat the adults to such an extent where if we could, we'd like to increase numbers of bats in areas where there are cornfields, but it's difficult to do that. Bats don't cooperate very well. You can't just catch a bunch and release them somewhere. It doesn't work that way. So what we did, we found out in Texas that if we put stereo speakers in cornfields that played the sounds of bats, the very high pitched, and these aren't normal stereo speakers, that the moths wouldn't lay eggs there because they heard the sounds, thought it was bats, and went somewhere else. So clever use of some science there to deal with a pest that's eaten by bats. Bats, yes, do eat mosquitoes. Um, predators, just to mention that bats are predators, but things do eat bats. There are places in the world where humans eat bats. Um, not in this country. It would be against the law to do that. But what I want to show you is a few, and, and I know there are a lot of words here, but I'll show you a few pictures of things that eat bats, hawks, owls, and other things eat bats in this country and in New Jersey. Bats also have bed bugs, different species. They have fleas. They have mites. They have all the kind of typical parasites you would see in any wild animal. Any of you know what this is? The yellow, first, if you go to the yellow up there at the top, that's a glove on somebody's hand. A good idea to wear thick leather gloves when you're handling this animal. That's been caught in a net that normally we catch bats in. In this case, this bird was coming in probably chasing a bat, got caught in the net. Do any of you know what it is? It's an owl. Any of you know the species? It's normally a, kind of a swamp, wet place associated owl. It's about this big. It's kind of special when you hear them. They have a very distinctive, not a, not a hoot hoot kind of sound. It's a totally different kind of sound. It's a barred owl. And it's a pretty cool thing to hear one of these in New Jersey. There are not that many here. But there you go. And it is a predator of bats. Snakes. Our predators, snakes like this one, can climb trees. They are not just on the ground. They'll climb trees to go for birds' nests and bats. And sometimes they'll even hang out at the entrances to mines. This is a real picture. This is really a snake on a tree branch at the entrance to a, in this case, an iron mine. And it's literally snagging bats out of midair and eating them. So bats do have predators. In this case, Hard to imagine a scene like this, right? It sounds like a bad dream, but I guess it would be for the bats. And this. So I stopped down the interstate once, was heading south on the turnpike. Actually, this is New Jersey. Stopped at a rest area, looked over at a car and saw this blob on the front grill and thought, what? That looks familiar. And went over it. By the way, it has nothing to do with Chevrolet. But that's a red bat. That's a New Jersey native species hit by a car. Roadkill. Bats are killed by vehicles, believe it or not. In some cases, quite a few. So there's the evidence. Okay, now switching from food to where bats spend the day. And it's all over the place. It's not just in caves. When bats roost, they hang. 
they lock their toes, they literally ratchet their toes down, they don't have to use any muscles to control that, so they can relax and they could literally hang that way for months at a time, which they do when they hibernate. So it's a pretty cool mechanism. We can't do that. If you tried to lock your toes around a horizontal bar and hang, you could probably do that for a few seconds and that'd be about it. So imagine just ratcheting down and then relaxing your muscles and there you go, you're all set. Where bats spend the day ranges from trees to buildings to caves to old iron mines and this is wherever they live in the world. So there are even bats that spend cold days down in the leaves on the forest floor, which seems strange and risky, but it does take place. And summer, winter, I'm going to come back to this one and talk about the summer places where they spend the day and the winter places where they may spend months at a time, but just briefly. And why do this? It's kind of the usual. Why do you sleep? Why do you have a place like that? For bats, it's raising their young, it's digesting, it's sleeping, it's hibernating, it's resting. And for bats, they want to be out during the nighttime, not the daytime. It's very rare for a bat to be seen during the day. This is a red bat, which is native to New Jersey. It's a really pretty animal. It's not exactly red, let's face it. It's kind of a, a, kind of a rusty color. This one is roosting on a twig, on a shrub, in a cedar swamp down in South Jersey. We had just captured it. We put a band on it. You see that metal ring right here? It actually has a number that you can't see. It's out of sight that uniquely identifies this bat. And it's kind of roosting right there. It just, we just released it and it was a great photo opportunity, but they really do this during the day, literally out in the open on twigs of trees. So this isn't what you might think is the stereotype of what bats should do. Red bats look like this. This is just more pictures of red bats. This is another species of New Jersey called the hoary bat. Hoary because of the colors. It's really pretty. It's big. This is the biggest one here in New Jersey. And it also roosts during the day from tree twigs, right out in the open, up in the forest, uh, usually treetops. By the way, these two species fly south for the winter, just like birds do. Silver-haired bats, because they have kind of silver-tipped fur on their backs, typically roost under bark or in the crevices on trees that have very rough bark. So it's different. They're not on twigs, but on the bark. Different, different places. Big brown bats like this one are pretty common here in New Jersey. They like buildings, but before buildings were around, they used trees. So when you say use a tree for a bat, usually that's under loose bark or in a crack or crevice. They don't use big open cavities like birds do. So a bird house for a, a bat wouldn't work very well. Big brown bats look kind of like dogs to me, but on a very small scale. Very sharp teeth and very capable of eating like beetles, things that are very tough that other bats would find difficult to eat. This is kind of common for these particular ones, big brown bats, to be found under a deck. Um, they might be found in an attic, under shutters, behind gutters, uh, often around houses, but also in trees. So it's not just houses. And if you ever see them and you're looking at them, you'll find they'll be looking right back at you they're not going to attack you, but they're not going to like you there either. I mean, there are wild animals, but you don't have to be worried about them coming swarming down and attacking you. They won't do that. In fact, if you have bats, there are ways to get rid of them that are humane. You don't have to kill them. There are no pesticides that are approved to use against bats. Term, uh, exterminators can't kill bats. It's against the law. So you can do things like this just with netting. This is the kind of netting that people put on fruit trees to keep the birds away. And anyway, this is, a, this is the side of a house where bats are getting in through a little hole. And if you know where that is, you can actually do this so the bats can get out of the hole but can't get back in. It's just timing during the year you have to be important so that you know that these are not females with young babies inside your house. You wouldn't want to do that. In other words, there are ways to do this correctly, but I'm not going to go into all the details here. Okay, just some more species. Long-eared bats are fairly common, were fairly common here in New Jersey. This is one that included uh, 
this, this long-eared bat and the little brown bat that used to be so abundant is now being looked at by the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service as potential listed species as threatened or endangered beginning next fall. This is huge in terms of listing a species as threatened or endangered because it means money, it means people that own land have to be particularly um, vigilant about these, it means the government has to do a lot of things, it's going to be very interesting. Indiana bat, this is the official endangered species here in the northeastern United States. For most of you, it looks like most of the other bats. It's brown, it's small. It's subtly different than some of the others, but the Indiana bat is federally endangered, and that's a big deal. There are only a few species federally endangered in the United States, bat species. This is one of them. Bats like this one, roost in trees during the summer. Indiana bats rarely use buildings. So if you see this, this is a forest setting. This is Great Swamp National Wildlife Refuge near Morristown. And if you look at this tree right here in the middle, it's dead and all the other trees around it are living. Well, this is a tree used by a lot of Indiana bats, female Indiana bats, one summer. However, trees don't last a long time necessarily. This is the way it looked that fall. It was on the ground. So trees come and go for bats. They're ephemeral. Buildings are great because buildings usually last longer. But this is something bats have to deal with. If they use trees, they have to be able to switch trees to other sites that are not on the ground. Bats, of course, go underground. This is an iron mine near Picatinny Arsenal that was recently explored for bats and it did have Indiana bats, which is pretty exciting for the state of New Jersey. So if you see, here's a person here. This is Melissa Craddock, who used to work for the Endangered and Non-Game Species Program in New Jersey. And this is another rope specialist up here. The entrance is way up here on the surface of the ground, and there's this big shaft that comes down, and then some other tunnels that go off to the side. And when they were exploring down here, they found quite a few bats. It's a dangerous place to be, as you can imagine, because this is an old iron mine. It's been there for 100, 200 years, and it's literally just caving in all the time. Good place for bats. This is a cave in Austin, Texas, used by millions of bats, females, every summer. The inside of the bat, or inside of the mine or cave, looks like this. Now, if you look in this picture, all this dark brown, that's bats. The bear, that's limestone rock. So everything else is bats at about 200 per square foot. That's what it looks like up close. That's a mother and a bunch of babies, except one of the babies is hers, not the rest of them. So you guys, it's pitch dark back in here. There are several million babies. How does mom find hers? Memory, smell, touch, Sounds, yeah, we only, you could, any of those are really good guesses. We only found out recently a graduate student did a project and found out it was smell, and it wasn't the baby's smell, but it was mom's odor that she put on her baby. Baby mammals typically don't have an odor. It's like an anti-predator thing, so in, interesting case. But they're literally about three, 400 bats per square foot in this case with the babies. In the winter time, this is a picture from an airplane showing uh, actually Wanakew Reservoir, but the white is snow, it's ice, it's winter, so what do bats do now? Let's shift from summer to winter. They typically go underground and they'll hibernate inside caves or mines, especially here in the northeastern United States like this bat. It'll hang there for several months at a time and even though this one's covered by little droplets of water, it's just fine. And we'll see clusters of them like this. It's very typical to see them all grouped up, clustered. There are two species here. There are one, two, three, four, five of one species. Let's see, one, two, three, four of one species, two of another. The two are federally endangered. The other four are common. Can you see the difference? Look at color. and one of them has a band. This one and this one, see the color? It's kind of a grayer look. 
That's, those are Indiana bats. These others are little brown bats. So this is the Hibernia mine. This is a location where just a few years ago, before 2009, there were 30,000 hibernating bats. The uh, state just went back in last week. They found about 600. That result is from white nose syndrome, that fungus that I'll mention here in just a moment as I move along. Um, conservation efforts, and I'll make this really short, yeah. is roosting sites that you can build for bats and protect habitat. So we can, gate, we can literally put up gates in mines like this or caves to keep people out, let the bats fly through. Bridges are bat friendly, believe it or not. There's a very famous one, this one in Austin, Texas, that's now a tourist attraction because of all the bats that come out at dusk. Or you can build bat houses or buy them. This one's actually commercially available, this. But those hold lots of bats and are commonly used. There's a couple of my students looking at them. White nose syndrome started, and just real quick on dates. 2006 was the first discovery, 2009 it hit New Jersey, and it's caused by a fungus, Geomyces destructans, that was just named as a new species about two years ago, and we know it's killed a lot of bats. This number is huge. That's, that's as of this year. <clears throat> so, it's spreading, and the symptoms of it look kind of like this, this fungus cottony appearance. The fungus attacks the tissues. There was a study that uh, some of us were part of at a National Wildlife Refuge down on the Delaware River, Sapana Meadows, where we actually enclosed a barn with uh, several thousand bats in plastic. And then all the bats funneled through this bat trap right here. And we caught hundreds and looked at them all. This is all of us grouped around ready for dusk. We looked at a lot of bats. Mick Vallant, this fellow over here, works for the state. He's the bat guy of the state of New Jersey. Annette Scherer next to him had just recently retired. That's an example of what the fungus does to bats. It really damages tissues. In some cases, it kills them outright. And this is what a map looks like of the occurrence of this fungus. Here's where it started up near Albany, New York. These different colors correspond to years. So 2009, it hit New Jersey. This is Morris County. And then, as you can see, red is just this winter and where it's continuing to spread both north and west and south. We don't know how far it's going to go. We think it might go coast to coast. There's no cure, there's no vaccine, and it continues to kill bats. The windmills, just to mention this also, because it's a factor not nearly as important, is, and I'll show you a picture and just give the description. This is Atlantic City, but there are thousands of these giant wind turbines across the eastern United States. They're more planned. As those blades spin, even though it looks slow, they're still capable of killing bats and migratory birds at night. And it is happening, it's real, and right now it looks like cooperation between the owners of those and the people who are the scientists studying bats and birds can maybe come to grips. Maybe they can actually shut these down during periods of migration, but it is a feature of mortality. And where am I with time, Dr. Party? You're Pretty close? Yeah, you're very close. Okay. Actually, oh, two minutes over. Uh-oh, okay, I'm going to go through some... So. Let, let me cut to the chase. When we do work on bats, we catch bats with nets. And when you see a bat in a net, it looks like that. Then we work to get it out, and it's unharmed, and then we can handle them, weigh them, measure them, and so forth. We catch other things, flying squirrels, insects. These are some bats. Let me go to measuring. We measure wings. We measure weights of bats. Sometimes we attach radio transmitters and we can actually track bats to see where they spend the day, which is really useful information. And sometimes we do that by airplane. This is Dr. Vale and my former graduate student, Marilyn Kitchell, who now works for the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service. Um, past that. This is a study I'm doing on mercury and the effects of mercury on bats. This is taking place with the FAA down around the Atlantic City Airport. 
the study of West Nile virus. My graduate student did a few years ago. This is when West Nile first came on the scene and we were looking at bats. And a light stick on a bat. I'll go past. That's to look at bat behavior. And whether you find bats cute or not, because some of you may or may not, uh, they're still worth our attention. They're disappearing at a rapid rate now with white nose syndrome. We're really concerned that some might go extinct, some species. And Fish and Wildlife Service and uh, academic institutions are working hard to try to figure out what to do about this. And that's the end. Thank you very much. What can we do to help the bats? Uh, uh, could we buy bat houses and put them up in the woods? What should we do to help you know, the bats? I, for a little while, because of white nose syndrome, bat houses were downplayed because it was feared that they would just transmit that fungus to more bats. Now it's being felt it might be a good conservation mechanism if the bats are there. Bats do like human built structures and they do like bat houses. Whether you make them yourself, you can make them pretty easily and cheaply. They're good scout projects or you can buy them and they're all different shapes and sizes. If it's built like a birdhouse, it won't work. If it's built with small um, pieces of wood to make for kind of narrow chambers, it'll probably work. But it has to be kind of lengthy this way. It has to have an open bottom. It has to be a dark color. It has to be not on a tree, but on a post or a pole of some kind or on the side of a barn. Uh, but that would be the best way. In terms of other, just broadly speaking, um, it's hard to say because it has to do with clean water, insects, and so forth. Bat houses work, though. You can, yeah. There's a place called, in fact, batman batmanagement.com is a good place to go to start looking. Yes, sir? Do you know if the um, white nose syndrome is like a genetic mutation of the same things that kills insects, like that fungus? We think it's a fungus introduced here from Europe, frankly. We think it's an introduced species like all the others, like West Nile virus. In Europe, it doesn't affect bats. Here, it seems to, and we think, genetically speaking, we think it came from Europe and was recently introduced. But we, that's all we know right now because it's so new. So that's the thought. Uh, you said bats use echolocation, correct? So for them to get eaten by a snake, uh, do they only use that when they're hunting? Yeah, good question about echolocation. How, how can a predator grab them? Yeah, sometimes when we catch them with nets, we know they probably weren't using echolocation because otherwise they would have detected the net. Sometimes they fly by memory. So when a bat leaves a cave or goes back into it, often it'll shut down echolocation and just fly by memory because it's done it so many times or just using its eyes. And that's when it's really vulnerable. And that's when we catch them because we've watched with night vision equipment, we've watched bats using echolocation, obviously, fly right up to a net full speed and like a little UFO do that or do that and avoid being caught. So they're so good at what they do, but they do shut down echolocation sometimes just because they know where they are, they're very comfortable with that area, and they just use their eyesight. Um, that goes into the thing about the wind windmills. Yes. I had heard that yes. the bats were being killed not necessarily because the blades were hitting them, but because they were getting the bends. Yes, yes. And it's both impact, it's also by the low pressure that they experience near the blades. And the other thing is, is the bats seem to be attracted to them. That's the doubt. They're curious. They go in close, and the tip of that blade's going maybe 100 miles an hour and, and smacks them. So I've seen pictures of them being hit almost like baseballs from a baseball bat. But the high pressure is also something that's killed some. Yeah, you're right. Yeah. Okay. Thank you, Lance. You're welcome.